Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to Alone But Not Lonely, Meditation for Lockdown, hosted by the newly established Contemplative Study Centre at the University of Melbourne. I'm Amy Bajaya. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. The Contemplative Study Centre was made possible by a very generous donation by Martin and Loretto Hoskin. We are delighted that this gift enables us to offer really important opportunities to simply be together in a mindful way. In terms of housekeeping, please feel free to ask your questions via the Q&A function throughout the event. We will get through as many of these as possible during the Q&A. The event is being recorded. I'm delighted to welcome Father John Dupouche. Father John is currently a senior lecturer at Catholic Theological College and has two major academic interests in both spirituality and interfaith. I would also like to welcome the inaugural director of the Contemplative Study Centre, Dr. Nicholas Van Dam. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Um, we'll just start off and for the guests, uh, just to give them a sense of kind of the plan, um, we'll follow sort of a, a similar pattern to how we did um, when we ran this the previous week. So we'll have a bit of discussion um, at the start, uh, just to get a sense of you and your background and sort of your particular style of meditation or the types of meditation with which you're familiar um, and, and to get a sense of the, the style in which you might lead us today. Um, and then we'll, we'll have a guided um, meditation that you'll lead us in. And then we'll, we'll follow on that from uh, with some, some questions uh, from, from myself potentially and from the audience. Um, so I guess just to get us started, um, you have quite an interesting background um, yourself, both you know, as, a, as a Catholic priest and um, with quite a bit of other experience and other ways, of, uh, ways and styles of meditation. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that and how you became interested in meditation? Well, I suppose my interest in meditation began very early. Uh, during my training days in priesthood training. And so I've been meditating now for a long, long time, um, many, many years indeed. And, um, but over these period of time as well, I've uh, developed interest in other religions, particularly in Hinduism, which is uh, remarkably rich and fruitful. And I suppose particularly a branch of Indian thought from a thousand years ago. So it's uh, very rich and it's finding very enriching. This whole question of knowledge of my own particular faith and also the enhancement that comes from uh, experience of other traditions as well. They're mutually enhancing and uh, challenging too, of course, uh, all these things go together. So I've uh, developed that interest. And um, so did you want me to speak a bit about my meditation practice uh, a bit more, Nicholas, at this Sure, stage? that'd be lovely to hear, yeah. Well, I suppose to put it very simply, uh, I meditate each morning for about an hour or so. And uh, I like to go early in the morning uh, before dawn. There's something special about before dawn. And um, I have a little meditation hut, which fortunately where I live is down near the Yarra River. So it's a very lovely location and I sit on the floor. There's something about sitting on the floor, which is an advantage, you know, because it's sort of ground, it feels a bit more grounded. So I sit uh, cross-legged as best I can. I'm not very subtle physically, so I can't sit very well, but I do to some extent sit cross-legged. And then it's a place of beauty and of calm. Uh, and I recommend people to find a place of beauty and calm, even their own home, of course, have a special place that might be reserved for, uh, in some fashion, reserved for the time of meditation. Of course, uh, it is made holy by the practice of uh, the sacred meditation. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the whole process of sitting is very instructive, because as they say in the old text, sit in your cell, it will teach you everything. So there's that. And then, of course, I then spend some time, uh, I suppose, with immense confidence. Uh, confidence is a big part of meditation, it seems to me. That um, confidence that things are basically good. Uh, even the troubles that we might have, uh, these are 
well, they're important, of course, and very troubling sometimes, but deep down, things are basically good, full of possibility, and the good things will happen. And so I spend my time there in some in confidence, um, knowing particularly that, well, I am loved. It's an important thought to have, that I am loved, uh, known, understood somehow by someone. Uh, and that sort of sense of being loved uh, from the beginning, in fact, from before my beginning. Uh, and that's a very important aspect of things. And more than just being loved, um, that I, that us, that we, are uh, people worth dying for. And this is at the very essence of the Christian faith. So I find that uh, very important and that all else pales into insignificance, even our mistakes and our failings. These are, uh, well, uh, can be left aside in face of the sense that we are known, loved and understood. Anyway, so I spend some time there uh, and talk a bit about the, uh, focus a bit on the breath and I enjoy the breath. The breath is something to be enjoyed. Uh, it is a very comforting experience and um, to enjoy breath means enjoying life. And then, of course, the, next, the, the main thing is to enter into the heart. So to go to the very center of what is most important to me, what is essential to me, who I am essentially deep down. Uh, so a deep awareness and with this sense of entering into the heart to, uh, to wait this business of waiting, uh, full of expectation, expectancy, but waiting, not presuming on anything, not shaping things in any particular fashion, but waiting. And then things arise in that context of awaiting. And this arising, of course, is the, uh, all the things that the emotions, the experiences, the thoughts, the uh, attitudes, the energies that arise uh, in that context, and this sort of radiates out. So there's a radiating out um, beyond myself. So that's putting very simply uh, the way I sort of approach my meditation, but I think it's uh, a way that is, you know, uh, not a difficult way and could be of interest to people who are uh, listening. Thank you for that. Um, it ra raises a couple of interesting questions for me that if we don't have time now, we, maybe we can pick up after. But um, first, I wonder, I guess, for people who struggle with this concept of um, of love, of sort of recognizing that they're loved, um, you know, which if you're coming from a, um, a religious tradition or particularly a Christian one, you sort of, there is the sense of certainly of, of God loving you. But if you're not coming from that tradition, or, or I guess even just um, if you are and people struggle with the recognition, you know, or, or the willingness, I guess, to, to really entertain the possibility of their love. What, what would you recommend for people? How would they, how do they kind of overcome this tendency that we often have to be quite self-critical and quite negative with ourselves? Well, I think you raised a good point there. We tend to be self-critical uh, and that can be balanced. Sometimes it's good to be self-critical. There's perhaps good reasons sometimes to be self-critical but needs to be balanced also with a sense of self-compassion and uh, self-kindness and self-love. Uh, so that if we, uh, while we acknowledge perhaps the failings that we have, uh, beneath all of that, there is, I think, value in saying, well, that's not the whole story. We're not simply a set of negatives. There is also good things to us. We need to listen to our own voice as well as the voice of other people. And our voice doesn't have to be just a critical voice, but also uh, a self-appreciative, a self-trusting voice, and to uh, acknowledge and welcome one's self. I think that's, uh, I think it has to be balanced out because in this process of self-compassion and self-love, uh, then uh, we start to begin to appreciate that perhaps we are loved also more widely. And this idea then of being loved more infinitely. So I think that's probably, that, that may be of some counterbalance, I think, to the 
excessive self-criticism that we have. And what about, um, the, you know, finding one's place and sort of finding a way to sort of, I guess, enjoy being in the body? Um, I know I know there are people, particularly sort of, you know, people with, with troubled pasts or um, it may be individuals just who experience quite a significant amount of, say, anxiety or distress. Um, and I've, I've had people actually reach out to me sort of and say that for them, the, the breath is actually a, a point of um, distress, you know, for, for, for various reasons. They find themselves sort of, you know, trying to control the breath or um, sort of focusing too heavily on, on the breath in negative ways. Um, do you have advice or suggestions about how come kind of one's, one comes to be and just sit with the breath? And this may relate in some ways to that kind of um, openness to kind of whatever arises as well, uh, and sort of that you mentioned kind of as the latter part of, of how you practice. I think there, so often people, I mean, we all, all of us, uh, we, um, I suppose sometimes our relationships with people might not be, you know, there can be difficulties in relationships, uh, difficulties in physical pain, people feeling unwell. Uh, and these are big issues that have to be given due importance. The question is to what extent can we at the same time see these things even the physical pain or the emotional stress revealed in the difficulty of breathing to see whether we can, in a sense, uh, let them go to try and focus the attention elsewhere. Because there are many different time and we can uh, very often focus upon what is concerning us and rightly concerning us, but not also look at other things that are comforting and that are, are helpful. So it's a question of where one places one's focus. And if there's physical pain, for instance, well, that is very real. Uh, and yet, uh, as they say in the pain management people, they talk about focusing elsewhere besides the pain. Uh, easily said, of course, and not easily done, but still the possibility lies there. And there can be all sorts of pain, pain with regards to questions of work. Uh, the COVID crisis has brought up a whole series of difficulties for people, emotional, relational, the whole range, stresses of all sorts. But within that sense of stress to find something else and to place the attention there. I think it's, it's, it's easily said, but I think with practice, it is more possible. Do you think, uh, is, that, is that just a method of distraction or is there another way of looking at it? Distraction sounds as though it makes it unreal. Uh, it's distraction in the, in the strong sense of the word distraction, that is turning my, one's mind away from the difficulty, the worry, but it is really moving to what is more true. Because even if we are in pain, emotional pain or physical pain, uh, there is more to us than just the difficulty. Um, we learn to be rich or poor, we learn to be healthy or sick, and we learn to be uh, equal in both. So a sense of equanimity, no matter what might come, uh, to find that balance within. Uh, I think that's the whole question of exploring the heart, is to find the very center of our being, of which the pains and difficulties are the waves on the surface of the ocean, but deep down there's great stillness. So it's a letting in, I suppose, of, of, of other things as opposed to just fixating on, on one aspect of experience and sort of broadening one's awareness and sort of trying to specifically incline towards positive aspects yes. or positive features as well and, and sort of other aspects of one's being. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh... And what would you say for, for individuals who you know are perhaps not coming from a Judeo-Christian background? What, what kinds of things 
can they glean or what insights can they learn from, from the, the practices that particularly sort of the meditation or contemplative practices that exist within the Judeo-Christian traditions? Um, what, what sort of how might one engage with them in, in a meaningful way and sort of find value and um, and solace in, in these practices? Well, I, I think it's by uh, entering into stillness, being uh, physical, but also emotional stillness uh, to find the deep peace that's there at the very heart of things. Uh, I think to enter into that uh, in the first instance and to go there, uh, as a result, other things will arise. And so the knowledge of oneself leads to a knowledge of the self, uh, however the, the self is understood, of course, uh, and the uh, the love of oneself leads to a sense of uh, a love more widely. So I think leaving aside the Judeo-Christian element of things, uh, as you suggest, I think for a person, someone who's not in that tradition, to simply focus upon stillness and love and acceptance of oneself and self-respect uh, to focus there and as I say things will happen discoveries will occur and the person opens up uh, because we are a work in progress and the this is not static we are not static beings and uh, as we enter into love self-love self-respect uh, this opens up more broadly and we discover whole worlds we didn't know existed and the, uh, the fountains of, of water spring up uh, that remain untapped. Beautifully put, thank you. Um, I guess finally, just a, a, maybe perhaps a little bit of advice, you know, a lot of people um, find themselves in the, at the present moment, particularly in Victoria, um, in sort of difficult conditions, perhaps alone, perhaps with a lot of time to explore things or being forced to explore things that they previously hadn't. Um, you know, their day-to-day -day lives, aspects of um, how they interact with close loved ones, or perhaps how they interact with themselves for those who, who live alone. Um, what, what advice, I guess, might you give to them sort of more generally about sort of how to um, kind of weather these experiences or to, um, to cope well in, in the context of, of these times? And then there may be some hints of what you've already said. Well, of course, th these are very stressful times. We, you know, we, we all feel the impact of being isolated and confined and, you know, <laughs> in a sense, imprisoned in one way or another. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I think that the heart, to use the word heart, the inner essence of our being, the depths of our being, contain worlds that are wonderful and exciting. And the, the, uh, we talked about the pleasure of the breath before, uh, or the mere pleasure of sitting still. These things uh, are more exciting or can be more exciting than jumping on some uh, plane and going to some exciting uh, part of the world, which remains external. So if we go to some beautiful island somewhere in the Pacific or whatever, it's very beautiful, but it's outside ourselves. But to find the beauty and comfort and enjoyment uh, and pleasure within, this is something that is abiding. So it's a question then of people in their uh, isolation, in their confinement, find the, the discoveries that are waiting there within. Uh, and uh, this, of course, takes some time, uh, but it it's, uh, it can develop. And uh, so when I'd meditate in my hut there, uh, it's far more exciting, I assure you, although I like watching films, uh, there's far more real enjoyment there, more solid enjoyment than watching some good film. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd invite you sort of now to, to guide us through a, a meditation practice. Well, thank you. So we'll, uh, I'll say a few words from time to time, and then we have a bit of stillness, I think, and then 
uh, I'll say some more things. But, you know, we're taking up uh, elements of what we've already been talking about. And I suppose the first thing is to, um, to be still, to sit still. Uh, of course, this requires, as we all know, I think we're all experienced about this from other talks that we've attended, uh, the importance of sitting in a position which is uh, neither floppy nor uncomfortable. So to, to sit well and to uh, neither leaning to the left nor leaning to the right, backwards or forwards, but sitting upright and to be still and to uh, especially if we can be in a place which is, has some beauty about it. Um, uh, and then to focus within. So how about we take up a position of stillness and to focus your attention upon uh, how you feel your body, because the body is a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, it will teach us everything. Uh, we could have talked about chakras, but we won't talk about that at the moment. But the body is a wonderful thing. So to perhaps spend a bit of time then sensing your body from within. So just feel your body from within. It's called proprioception. So feel from within. You might feel the weight of your body on the chair or the floor. You may sense the heart beating. You may say a sense of tension somewhere, it's okay. Worries may be occupying the mind, but if possible, uh, leave those for the moment and decide about them later. But for the moment, just focus upon the interior feeling of the body. And if you can, enjoy the body, enjoy the feeling of the body, enjoy one's physicality.
there may be anxieties about one's failings, one's mistakes in the past. But let these go for the moment and focus the mind elsewhere. then perhaps we can shift the attention now to the breath. The breath reveals emotions. But if we can focus upon the breath and allow it to function naturally, not pushing it or anything else, but just to let it flow in and out, If anxieties alter the quality of the breath, see if it's possible to simply focus upon the enjoyment of the breath coming in and the relaxation of the breath going out. So focus on the breath in and then the breath out. So enjoyment is a big part of breathing, a big part of life. So I enjoy the breath that comes in oxygenating the body and the breath going out, which relaxes the body. So enjoyment and relaxation. then perhaps we can start to shift the focus again now uh, and to focus upon the heart, the physical heart if you like, but above all the region of the heart. To focus there and to explore the heart, explore what is felt for us. Explore the warmth of the heart. 
explore the heart of our being, the heart of the matter. So go to the very depths of one's beings, an enormous sensitivity to what is most important to us and to rest there. And perhaps as we focus upon the deepest self-compassion, look upon oneself with an element of to be soft to ourselves. as we focus upon the inmost reality that we are, to have a sense of self-forgiveness and self-respect. It's a process too of self-valuing and self-trusting. So this focus on the heart with all these attitudes of mind. And then we start to value ourselves enormously. And it can happen then with time and it can happen that our sense of self-compassion and self-respect expands and we start to discover that not only do we respect ourselves but we are we are respected and loved and valued infinitely of course all this takes time so we have to wait. Things may happen, things may not happen, but we wait for all the wonders that are yet to be made known to us.
So within our failings then, and despite our failings, we know that we are loved. And if it is possible to accept the idea, to know that the one who loves us, loves us even to the point of wishing to die for us, the ultimate test of love. The fourth step then comes to this uh, feeling of a certain radiance after having sat still and focused upon the body, then focused upon the, heart, the breath, then focused upon the heart and the expansiveness that comes from this, then this naturally flows into a sense of radiance. So that one's goodness, which is there at the very heart of the things, this goodness radiates out like light and blessing. So a sense then of radiance from our own selves uh, to the benefit of all those around us. So just dwell there for a while with a sense of radiance. This radiance goes out, of course, in the first instance to those who are dear to us, but also the sense of goodness goes out even to those who are not good to us, with good intentions for them. So you might like to think of someone who is dear to you and let goodness come to them. From us. And then, of course, a universal sense of blessing. Well, I think I've come to the end of the time allotted to me, so we might return then to the next step. Thank you, John. We have a few questions from the audience. The first one is from Diana. Why self-forgiveness and why not self-acceptance? Well, I suppose uh, self-acceptance certainly, um, absolutely, absolutely self-acceptance. But I was thinking in, 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 the, in the situations where a person may, may have done something wrong. I mean, people, you know, <laughs> I suppose in that sense, there is uh, a need for forgiveness. Um, yeah, in that sense, um, I think facing, facing the reality that perhaps at times we've not always acted rightly, 
And there is need for forgiveness, not just acceptance, which I'm just wondering whether it is dodging the issue a little bit, if it's just self-acceptance. I agree, certainly, self-acceptance, but wrong may have been done, uh, and one needs to forgive oneself for the wrong done, and of course receive forgiveness of those who, to whom one has done some wrong. Um, so I think it's, it's, there's a lot involved in that field of, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue. And uh, um, so I think there's, there's um, self-acceptance, certainly. But I think there may be times when we need to have forgiveness. Could this be where a, um, you know, a position of sort of recognizing ethics becomes important? Um, you know, that th these practices are not just about, um, you know, cultivating attention or cultivating presence, but that there's also some ethics behind the way that we approach these. Um, and that, you know, if there is an ethical frame, then, you know, when one has done wrong or has done something that sort of doesn't match with their desires or intent, then that is the circumstance under which you might need to acknowledge what's happened and then find a way towards forgiveness. Yes, I, I think if someone had done something terribly wrong, uh, it has to be, meditation is involved with ethics, the right way of living and uh, right thinking, right action. Uh, and we can't dismiss that. Uh, it's, I think it's an, an illusion if people want to divorce ethics from meditation. They won't progress very far. We have a question from Toby. Thank you, Nicholas and John. You mentioned in the event description that John could reflect on the connections with yoga and the notion of transfiguration. I'd love to hear about this. <laughs> right, yes. Well, of course, uh, I've been talking to some extent concerning uh, a tradition, especially from the Greek Orthodox Church, a gr great a long tradition called hesychasm that was mentioned in the, in the blurb. Uh, and hesychasm, it seems, from the research that I've done, to have been very much enhanced by the traditions of yoga from India, which came via the Muslims uh, from India because they were living in India and uh, from the Muslims then, the Sufi Muslims in particular, who uh, brought elements of yoga into uh, Sufism, elements of Sufism, which in turn uh, was brought into Christianity uh, in the Middle East, Christians in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, I've written some articles on this, so if a person wants to get the articles, perhaps they can let me know. And um, so there would have been uh, connections. And when you read some of the Hesychast texts, you think they are yogic texts. They are so, uh, well, remarkably similar. So there is that, um, that element of influence there because traditions enhance each other. This, the history of religions is always a history of enhancement sometimes fighting, of course, but very often enhancement as well. So we learn from each other and this, our own traditions are improved by knowing other traditions. But there was a second part to your question there, Amy, or the person's question um, about the yoga, but also I think something else was there. The connection with yoga and transfiguration. Oh, transfiguration, yes. Transfiguration is highly significant theme in the Greek Orthodox tradition, the Russian tradition, Russian Orthodox tradition, where, um, and it is very much connected with hesychasm, because the whole process of the transformation of the person, this whole opening up of the being, uh, means that a person becomes fully light, uh, there is no darkness anywhere. There's no opaqueness, no lack of awareness. Every 
element of one's being, physical, emotional, whatever it might be, every cell of our body becomes fully alive. And this is the process of transfiguration, which means change, transformation, but in the most brilliant sense possible. So they talk, this is the texts, the Hesychast writers, talk about becoming light and experiencing light, experiencing themselves as having become light. People like Simeon, the new theologian of the 10th century, or Seraphim of Sarov in the 19th century, they see themselves, they experience themselves, they see themselves as fully light. They are light, they see themselves by light. So it's that hope, hope of, of transformation. The body therefore is, is supremely important. It is not to be discarded or to be rejected, but to be transfigured and to be brought to its fullness, which is possible uh, in a whole variety of ways, of course, but we're thinking today particularly about the process of meditation. We have a question from Simone. I struggle with the idea of sending good intentions to those who have harmed me. Is it enough to just let it go and mean no harm, but to just experience an indifference? It's one that we've all struggled well, with. I th yes, I, I think, yes, exactly. Uh, certainly, I think uh, people have to do what they can. And if the, they do no harm, that's certainly a first step. There's no revenge involved, which is a huge, a huge, wonderful step to make, uh, to refuse to, all revenge or feeling of revenge. Uh, indifference, I suppose. Um, um, but a person can only do what they can do. But if in exchange for harm, one can, if possible, do some good, then that is the real turning of the tables um, because it changes the debate. It changes the topic. The topic is no longer now about harm or not doing harm, but doing good. And this is real victory and strength and triumph is to return good for evil, in the, to the extent that one can. Obviously, often, oftentimes there's, there's no possibility. But if one uh, can bless those who curse, do good to those who do harm to us, then one shows immense strength of character and firmness of being. So that we become, we're fully real. In fact, nothing can fundamentally prevent us from being who we are, because we radiate good where there is evil. We are light in the darkness. So, uh, but a person has to do, so the person who asked the question, they do what they can, but there may be further possibilities. I wanted just to, to comment on that. Um, in the, in the, in certain Buddhist traditions, and certainly Thich Nhat Hanh has sort of emphasized this this kind of idea, and it's also something that uh, gets used in the context of psychotherapy, um, which you know, even as a practicing psychologist, um, when you find someone that has wronged you, or you find someone that you are spending time with, you know, with whom you don't like, you try to recognize some common humanity, some common element, or some feature that, or to, to, I guess, to recognize that there is some good in them. Um, and so it can be as simple as a recognizing that the person sort of had a mother that loved them as, you know, in, in the same way that you had a mother who loved you. Or it could be that, you know, something very, very simplistic, like they have a good sense of humor, even though they might be a terrible person in other ways. Um, do you think that that kind of approach can be helpful to, I guess, move forward or sort of maybe, you know, even if it's not sort of finding a way to forgive the person, but to move forward in your own um, reaction to that person? Uh, absolutely, I think absolutely. To, to try and see the elements that are good there. We're all mixtures of good and bad, I suppose, you know, perfect and imperfect. We're all mixtures of things. And to, to see uh, the element of good that is there, the element that is full of possibilities in that person, to acknowledge that and to try and focus. Of course, 
that can be difficult if the person is particularly <laughs> I should put it, unlikable, uh, then uh, it can be very, very hard indeed, but it, it softens the situation a little bit. And to recognize that perhaps they, the other person does have possibilities, even in all their, their mixtures, and there is some possible goodness in store for them in the future. Thank they you. too are loved despite their weaknesses. Yes. We have a question from Bill. As we age and often spend more time quite naturally in a reflective and contemplative state of mind, do you feel it is also quite natural that we need less time in formal meditation? Ah, very good question indeed. Because the whole point of spending time in meditation is that all our moments are meditative. Uh, so that the moments of, you might say, practice, these are to produce in us a constant state of awareness and openness and uh, sensitivity uh, and to uh, enjoyment of one's body, enjoyments of one's breath. So there is this, the time of meditation is preparatory, practice time, you might, you might say, for uh, the whole 24 hours of the day and therefore as that person says as they grow older perhaps they do have do have they, they have acquired a great sense of universality so that every word they say is a blessing the reaction they do is a ritual in the proper sense of the word that is something that reveals uh, things beyond anything we've imagined so I think there's a, there's a lot of value in the, what that person says, but to make our time of meditation practice for universal meditation at every time. I, I liked John what you said earlier about us being a work in progress, and I think um, it's a very it's a very nice idea in the sense that you know if we're a work in progress, there, there's always more work that can be done, um, and so I, I thought that that's something that might particularly apply here. Um, the other thing I, I thought is. Um, it, it, this might be a useful distinction in, in certain approaches or certain traditions, uh, particularly sort of say in the mindfulness-based stress reduction approach, there's this idea of a distinction between formal and informal practice. Uh, you know, formal being the time you set aside to, to contemplate or practice meditation, informal being the way in which you embody the practice in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and perhaps what um, Bill is sort of getting at is that as you've spent quite a lot of time practicing, perhaps the, the extent to which you become informal, um, informally practicing sort of in your day-to-day -day life becomes more and more common. Uh, yes, yes, I think it's, that's a nice distinction to make. And um, in the sense, the informal is more significant, if we put it in those terms, than the formal, because that's what, so the whole of life then becomes uh, imbued. I read a, a, a wonderful, um, a quip about this recently, I think it was by Jack Cornfield that said a, a practitioner, a student of his had actually, after a, an extremely long period um, studying in a monastery, had actually taken a sign uh, to, describing the zendo, the place in which he practiced, and actually put it atop his, the inside of his door leading out into the world. So he decided to leave the <laughs> monastery, but he actually then turned it on his head and said that the place to really be practicing is in the world, not, not in one's home. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. We have a question from Brody. Um, Brody says, thank you, John. I'm wondering what your experience is with dealing with people in the Christian faith who are not open to recognizing goodness in other faiths. Is this something that you encounter often? And if so, how do you approach this? Well, there are certainly people who uh, in the Christian faith, but you'd say any faith for that matter, it's not just Christian faith, who don't see any value in other traditions. And I think that is simply uh, ignorance, basically. Uh, and I'm heavily involved in interfaith relations in Melbourne. And uh, I suppose uh, it's a question of education, uh, breaking them out of their ignorance. And um, uh, all traditions can be ignorant, uh, too focused, uh, too closed in on their own tradition. And the it can be a bit threatening, of course, to move out and to consider the truth and the holiness of other faiths, 
this can be threatening because it raises all sorts of questions about one's own tradition uh, that it needs to learn from other traditions in the without in any sense diminishing the value of one's own so that's why i like the idea of enhancement so i found myself enhanced by my uh, introduction to hindu traditions and others as well of course um, and what can one do i suppose one can invite them to meet other people I've met most wonderful Muslims in Melbourne, wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, I would like other people to meet them. Uh, wonderful Jewish people and uh, Buddhist people, just wonderful. Um, and, to, and also wonderful people who have no tradition, no faith tradition, and to meet them and to enjoy the truth that's in them and the holiness that's in them. Because even those who profess no, no faith can indeed and often do have a profound holiness about them. So that's something that's deeply sacred about them. Um, not everyone, of course, <laughs> but, uh, but profoundly so. And I think to, to experience that is a wonderful opportunity. Beautiful. Thank you, John. We have one final question before we finish up today. Um, it's from Teresa. Teresa says, I'm fascinated by your comment that you sit enjoying with yourself as much as getting on a plane and going to a new destination. Your meditation practice gives me clues about how you've got to this place. Do you have any other advice about how we can try to get to this place? I think find someone you admire some teacher whom you admire uh, some spiritual person whom you consider to be truly wise and truly loving uh, and to uh, be with them uh, learn from them i suppose but above all to be with them i think to learn by osmosis osmosis is one of the best forms of learning to be with good people one learns how to be good to be with holy people one learns how to be holy to be with enlightened people one learns how to be enlightened irrespective of any words that may be said so i would suggest that that person then um, i think of her name now that person might uh, look for uh, people who are uh, truly sacred but also perhaps even to look at images that are truly sacred if they can't find a person perhaps they can find an image or a building or a place in nature uh, and to allow that building that image that place in nature to transform them just want to also underscore the, the comment that you've made you've hinted to earlier john which is it takes time um and i think so often we we want to get quickly to the place of having a blissful wonderful experience and practice and when you mentioned that earlier i thought of there's this wonderful book we have for my five-year-old son by mo willems um that's called waiting isn't easy or is not easy <laughs> and i think i can I, every time i read it i can i connect with it myself um and I think that that's really important in, in this practice and in, in, in the variety of practices is that one has to be patient um, and be open to things as they arise. And I think your, your other point, which is to um, you know, surround yourself and, and put yourself in the presence of good, inspiring people um, that really can help you to see the possibilities down the road and can help you along the path. I think that's incredibly important and promising. And that's a lovely way to leave it. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Father John, for joining us. Thank you to all of our attendees. We hope to see you next week at our next event. Um, it's on Wednesday at 12.15. So have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.